Welcome to everyone to the um, development dialogue that we're hosting today on small business. We've got um, two presentations today and one apology from Moja Lefe, who's from the small business department, who unfortunately has a strat plan that they only found out about late last week. So um, he's unfortunately unable to make it. Um, he was going to come in um, to present some of their insights and also um, be a discussion for the papers we presented. So our two papers um, we're going to look at today, um, one is the Small Business Real Economy Bulletin, which looks at the state of small business in South Africa, and a very comprehensive overview, overview of a number of different metrics um, that look at where things are going on the small business sector. Um, it's not all bad news, so and the CFL will present all of that. Um, we'll then take questions um, on her presentation, and then we'll move to um, Niva Mahetra's presentation, looking at um, small business and industrial policy. And that's a research paper that we worked on um, last year, the beginning part of this year. And that um, tries to contextualize how we need to do more for small business and how we need to unblock some of the constraints to, to effectively make a step change in our thinking on small business support. Um, we, we come with some interesting arguments there about uh, probably doubling the number of small business in the country. And that's the kind of thing that we need um, if we want to re really see the economic growth that we need in the country. So Neva will talk to that. Um, we, we gonna, um, we, we're not going to do the usual round of introductions like we, we used to do um, in a pre-COVID day when we had a whole lot of people in the room, it was easier. Um, so we've, we've got a hybrid event, um, so we hope that it, it works well. Um, we will um, allow people from the room and online to um, make comments um, after the presentation, so if we can wait till the presenters are done and note your questions down, then we'll do the CFO um, and then go into Neva's presentation and we can have questions after that, and then we can open up for a general discussion. One of the things we always say in the development dialogue is that we, we recognize that we're just presenting our research, or we've got researchers presenting, and there's people in the audience who are often experts. So we would love to hear people in the audience's views and insights in the, the issues that we're discussing. Um, and then we'll, we'll do a mix of those online and those in the room um, with, as we get into the questions and discussion session. Um, let me hand over to Lucefo. Uh, Lucejo is a researcher at Aptips um, and has spent quite a bit of time on this um, bulletin and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lucejo. Um, I have a bit of nasal congestion so I hope you can all hear me properly. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting on um, the small business REV data um, and this is um, based on uh, status, status the data that we've looked at. And we basically just looking at the trends and performance of the small business sector in South Africa, which is particularly important. So I'm going to take you through trends that looks at employment um, as well as employment um, demographics in the sector. Uh, I'll also look at the distribution of small business in South Africa by location as well as looking at across various industries. And I'm also going to look at the annual financial statistics um, for the small business sector that looks at the profitability of small business, that looks at assets as well as value add. And I think, you know, all of us here can appreciate and acknowledge the importance of the small business sector. But when it comes to um, having a reliable and consistent database or tracker for the small business sector in South Africa, we actually don't really have one. And so this edition of um, the RME attempts to shed some light onto some of the very important statistics for small businesses. And I think they're particularly important for informing um, policy makers and policy decisions um, as to what is happening in the small business sector landscape. Um, and so I really hope that this presentation is going to be informative and I hope to engage with um, everyone in terms of, you know, where um, we can improve as well as some of the gaps that um, arises when it comes to our analysis. Thank you. Um, 
So in terms of the first uh, slide, um, it looks at, I guess, contextualizing the small business sector by looking at the number of small businesses in South Africa. And the numbers are based off um, employers and own account workers. And this is from uh, the Cula Face data by Status A. And what we see over time, um, so the data that I look at is from um, 20. 2010 all the way up until the fourth quarter of 2022 and what we've seen over time is that there's actually been an increase in the number of small businesses in South Africa. So in 2010 um, we had around 590,000 small businesses in South Africa in the formal sector and by 2019 the number of small businesses increased to 680,000 and Sorry. Um, and we also saw the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the small business industry, where a lot of businesses were affected and they had to shut down. And what we saw was that the COVID-19 actually brought an initial um, decline of about 25% um, in the number of small businesses. And this was largely seen in the second quarter of 2020. Um, but the number had actually recovered to around 710,000 by 2022 small quarter. And we're looking at, um, so we're looking at the informal businesses, for example, um, but informal businesses there, um, we can see that the numbers actually fell more sharply than formal businesses at the start of the pandemic, but they recovered faster, which I think is also quite impressive, especially given that in terms of support, um, government relief support for small business sector was actually more geared towards um, formal businesses with the informal businesses not receive, not being able to receive um, relief and support from the government. So we also looked at um, business owners, uh, looking at employers and also the self-employed at the percentage of total employment in South Africa compared to other um, upper middle income countries. That South Africa um, often lags behind um, upper middle income countries when it comes to um, small businesses, and that's largely a result of the apartheid um, legacy because it caused uh, destruction to um, small business sectors in Africa, particularly black owned businesses. And this was in not only urban areas, but also in rural areas. And also post 1994, we also see that small businesses continue to um, be hindered by lack of financing. And um, so this shows that there's still quite a lot of room. Um, for South African small businesses to grow. And when we look at, for example, um, the percentage or rather the share of small business owners in um, upper middle income countries, we see that it's 20 percent, where I'm sorry, of the working age population, whereas in South Africa, the percentage is only 6 percent, which is quite low. And then in terms of um, value add, again, this is from the annual financial statistics data. Uh, so we look at value add assets as well as profitability for um, formal small businesses. And in terms of remuneration type of pre-tax for the e-registered um, small businesses, we found that small businesses actually accounted for, um, so small businesses accounted for just over 30% of remuneration plus like pre-tax profit um, in the formal non-agricultural private sector. And in terms of the largest share of small businesses, this was largely in um, services, and this is services excluding domestic services. And then what we also see is that when it comes to mining, for example, we have very minimal um, or very few number of small businesses, even though we know that in, in the mining industry, um, there are quite a, a, a number of small businesses, particularly specialized small firms that perform critical um, work for larger mining companies along the value chain. But then when it comes to capturing some of those firms, they're mostly captured in logistics as well as in uh, construction. We looked at uh, small business assets and employment, again, for VAT registered businesses. Sorry. Um, and what this data shows is that for small enterprises, they held almost a fifth of um, private formal business assets in 2020, although they provided close to a third of formal remuneration. And also, we saw that disparity was particularly large in manufacturing where um, small firms were concentrated in comparatively um, labor-intensive industries. And also when we looked at um, 
the small business uh, enterprise share in terms of African manufacturing, we found that small business enterprise held over 13%, um, but only paid 25% of remuneration. So when it comes to profitability, we look at the rate of return on assets by business size as well as sector. Um, and the data shows that for small businesses, um, they generally reported a higher rate of return compared to, for example, the larger um, enterprises. So, for example, small businesses reported a 5% rate of return compared to 2% reported by um, large companies. And what we saw is that over, over time, particularly in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, the rate of return on assets actually declined for virtually um, all companies as the pandemic hit. And then, sorry. Um, so employment is quite important, um, particularly when discussing um, small business because small businesses often Small business sector often seen as the key driver for employment creation as well as employment opportunities. And so, this um, slide um, aims to show the importance of the small business sector when it comes to employment generation. And so, uh, when we looked at 2022, we found that um, small formal businesses generated 30% of um, total employment and 32% of all wage jobs, including informal jobs as well as domestic uh, work, and also half of wage work in the formal private sector. And when we look at wage employment, for example, for um, small businesses, this was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also saw that um, in terms of the jobs that, in terms of formal jobs that were lost during the second quarter of 2020, um, most of these uh, formal jobs reported were waste employment uh, jobs. And also when it comes to the number of um, formal, when it comes to the number of um, formal employers and self-employed people, it remained relatively stable, and this it's this number here. So over the years since 2010, um, that number has remained um, relatively stable even after the COVID-19 pandemic. We looked at employment by size um, in terms of the number of enterprises, and what we saw from the 2019 data is that for um, all account workers, um, operated a quarter of uh, small formal businesses and then for the informal businesses we found that all account workers were quite dominant and at least four out of five informal enterprises were actually run by all account workers. And then for median uh, monthly earnings um, we looked at for 2010 2015, 2019, as well as 2020. And then some of our findings show that um, wage workers um, earnings in formal businesses range between 25% and 30%. Um, um, so these are the wage workers. So it ranged between 25% uh, and 30% of the employers' um, reported incomes in 2010. And then by 2020, um, this had actually climbed to 50%. Um, and this was 40 and 50 percent as much as earnings for all account workers. Um, and then in terms of the informal um, employment median earnings, what we saw is that employers, informal employers, earn slightly more um, than formal wage workers. Uh, but for informal all account workers and employees, they earn considerably less. Um, and then we also looked at the share of uh, wage workers in terms of um, employment conditions, so looking at written contracts, whether workers have written contracts, um, as well as UIF and other benefits such as medical aid, pensions, and whether workers were part of um, a union. And what we found is that for the formal sector, um, basic conditions for small formal enterprises lagged only slightly behind those in larger companies, and we can particularly see it here for a written contract as well. Um, and then when it comes to informal businesses, um, these typically provided low incomes and comparatively insecure jobs, which is the trend when we look at informal businesses because the jobs tend to be a lot more precarious, they tend to also have very little social protection as well as social security. 
And then for a number of small businesses by sector and by industry, um, we see that approximately a fifth of uh, private formal businesses provide professional services. And these are services such as education, for example, healthcare services, as well as um, engineering and legal services. And um, at least a quarter of private formal businesses were in retail as well as hospitality. And then when we look at the informal sector, we see that most of the jobs, um, sorry, most of the businesses in 2022 were actually in retail trade. And retail actually accounted for close to half of all businesses. Um, and this was followed by the construction sector. And again, when looking at informal sector, we see that um, here, um, only just over 5% of, of informal businesses actually provided um, professional services. So we also looked at education, which is quite important when considering um, entrepreneurship. So we looked at the level of education according to business ownership. And what we found is that um, at least close to half of formal and owner account workers um, in the small business sector had a post-metric qualification. Um, and workers in small enterprises um, were slightly less educated um, than workers in larger enterprises, but it's only very marginal. Um, and also in 2022, a quarter of small formal employees and the third owner account workers had a university degree. Um, and then we also looked at, so going back to wage workers, okay, going back to wage workers, 42% um, of wage workers um, in the small formal business sector had a metric, 8% um, had a degree compared to 11% um, um, in large uh, formal enterprises. And we also found that for, in, for the informal sector or informal businesses, at least under 5% um, of employers and all account workers um, in the informal sector had a degree, um, and almost two thirds did not have a metric. Um, we looked at race and gender um, in terms of ownership. And in the early 2000s, what we found is that what, White business owners, um, white business owners, oh, sorry. Um, so in the early 2000s, white business owned, owners owned um, at least 60% of um, formal businesses in South Africa, even though they only make up 7% um, of the working population in the country. But then we saw that over time, or over the years, the share has actually fallen to around uh, 40%. Um, and it's remained at that it's remained at that level. Um, and when it comes to um, the informal economy and ownership uh, in terms of informal enterprises, we see that black people have actually consistently um, owned around ninety five percent of informal enterprises. And when we look at gender, for example, um, we found that women owned around a quarter of small businesses, and at least half of them were actually white. Um, and also in the informal sector, the share of women entrepreneurs declined um, from 45% in 2010 to 40% in 2019. And then there was a, also a further decline by 2022 to 35%. Um, we also looked at median uh, monthly earnings by race and gender. Um, and for this was for the year 2019. And the median earnings of a white uh, business owner who's, a, who's male uh, who owned a small formal business were almost twice as high as those for uh, black women and also for, for black men and women, and also for white women. And the difference between men and women who are black uh, owners in um, the small business uh, sector um, was only around 10%. Um, and also when we look at um, ownership, um, sorry, the last point. So looking at uh, ownership by gender, we saw that among small formal businesses, African women were actually um, almost as likely as white men to have a degree and nearly twice as likely as African men, but they still earned um, significantly less than either of these groups. 
So we also look at youth entrepreneurship, which is quite important because you know South Africa still continues to grapple with high levels of youth unemployment. And so it's important for government as well as other stakeholders to look at you know ways and collaborate to unlock opportunities for um, youth unemployment. And I think um, what our data shows is that over time, especially for youth aged 15 to 34, um, there hasn't really been that much growth um, in terms of um, business owners um, that are youth. Um, and so what we saw in 2019, using the 2019 data, is that the median age for wage workers um, was 35. And then for formal business owners, it was 45. And for um, informal owners, it was actually 41. And in 2022, 4% of young people aged 15 to 34 were business owners. And this equated to about 15% of all employed youth in South Africa. We looked at education um, as well, according to um, age group. Um, and this is for 2019 again. And so what we found is that for those aged 15 to 34, they generally had um, a higher uh, level of education than older adults. And for young business owners, um, they were almost as likely to have a degree, um, they were almost as likely to have a degree as their older counterparts and also much, much more likely to have a matric. We looked at uh, geography, which was at the distribution of um, small businesses across the various um, provinces and metros in the country. And what we found is that for the five largest metros being Johannesburg, Cape Town, Ekorulele, Tswane, and Etikwini, um, these metros, although they held just over a third of the population, they dominate when it comes to small business activity. And we saw that the concentration of um, formal small businesses in the biggest metros actually has in intensified over time. And you can see um, that over the years, the intensity increases. And by 2019, the largest metros actually um, held around 60% um, of all um, formal small businesses in the country. And in terms of um, looking at informal businesses, um, the five biggest metros held over 45% of um, informal businesses in 2022. We also looked at geography according to um, the presence of small businesses in historically labor sending regions. Um, and what we see um, from the graph is that formal small businesses are particularly limited um, in historical labor saving areas in South Africa, as these areas held um, around a quarter of the population in 2022, but only 5% of um, formal uh, small enterprises. Um, and then, um, second last slide, so some of the key takeaways from this, I think, are that the number of small businesses in South Africa is increasing, and this data is up until the fourth quarter of 2022, and we know that there's been an impact of the shedding on the small business sector, but this data does not capture that, and Status Day recently released um, the QLFS data last week, then I think that data should more um, accurately capture the impact that load shedding has had on small businesses, particularly when it comes to the numbers. Um, and also another key important takeaway is that in terms of um, ownership um, of small businesses, um, South Africa continues to lag behind um, other upper middle income countries. Um, and that shows that there's still more for us to do in terms of supporting small business sector as well as growing and developing the sector. And also um, in 2020, um, small formal businesses held a quarter of total business assets. And they were both more labor intensive and also a lot more profitable than larger companies. Um, and in terms of employment, um, small business, um, small formal businesses generated 30% um, of total employment in the country, 32% of all wage employment, including informal and domestic work, and also half of wage uh, work in the private sector. And then also um, 
in terms of education, as I mentioned. Um, so close to half of all business owners had a post-mature qualification. Um, and women owned around a quarter of small businesses, but half of them were white. And in the informal sector, the share of women entrepreneurs declined from 45% in 2010 to 35% in 2022. And then Going back to youth entrepreneurship, I think that's also a really big takeaway from this, is that in 2022, only 4% of young people aged 15 to 34 were business owners. Thank you. Let's open up for questions. Um, okay, um, should we'll take the questions in the room first, and then we'll move to online. I see there's a lot of comments in the chat. Um, so we may also want to see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, are there any questions in the room? I know Sean has a question. What, let's see, I'm not looking at the amazing stats that you have there. What is the story? We wake you up in the middle of the night. Is it a good idea for one of us to quit our job and start a small business now? What is the story? Thank you for the question, Sean. I think given the current climate and context that we find ourselves in right now for small business um, owners, I think a lot of them are struggling, not just because of load shedding, but also other issues that as South Africa we're grappling with. And in terms of quitting your job and owning a small business, I mean, I wouldn't do that. Um, but I, I think from the data I've seen, just the potential that you know the sector has, and it's not just only in South Africa, it's global, you know, when we recognize the importance of small businesses, particularly also when it comes to job creation. And I think that, you know, with um the um comparison that I showed where we compare South Africa to other upper middle income countries, we see that, you know, because we don't have um, you know, a large share of small business owners in the country, you know, when it comes to, for example, looking at employment, we tend to also fall short compared to those other countries because, you know, we haven't really been able to grow um, our small business sector. So, um, again, I think there's still a lot of work to be done and data really becomes important in terms of informing um, policymakers and informing where um, uh, help is required and also looking at, you know, what sort of impact can be made. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Okay, but just, Sean, you did put your job and start a small business. <laughs> but that was a while ago. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a question in the chat. Um, okay, is it possible to have a breakdown on a geographical basis, the employment contribution, small business, both formal and informal? Um, then another, we've noted that. Yeah. Okay. Then another question, how can we find a perfect fit working on the numbers given what it is we need to do to take place so that we stop getting numbers deaths as well as avoid the time bomb of rising unemployment and poverty. Um, and then there's another one that's just come in. Did you get a sense of the trade dynamics of small business? Are they importing, exporting? And how can they leverage all regional trade opportunities? Do you want to try those three? <laughs> and then we'll, there's one more after that. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions. I think the first question and the third question, you know, speak to some of the gaps in our analysis. So um, when it comes to the breakdown on geographical basis on employment. Uh, contribution in both formal and informal sector. We did not look at that, but that's something that we can look into. Um, so we can actually disaggregate the data down to looking at employment um, across the different um, areas um, in terms of location. And then I'm going to jump to the third one. Um, again, I think that's a, a, it's a gap. And, you know, when we look at the fourth edition of the RB, we can look at the trade dynamics, but it's not what we looked at now. We just looked at, um, I guess, industries where, you know, small business sectors are, um, what's the word, allocated. Um, yeah, so we haven't really looked at importing and exporting dynamics. So that's something that, I think will be interesting to look into. Um, and I think it will if there require a lot of interviews as well. Um, yeah, we did not look at any trade, um, but yeah. And the question by Lucy Diesel. Um, 
I'm not sure I understand the question. We, we can get into it in the discussions a bit later. Okay. Um, Neva, do you want to come in um, and answer some of those questions? Because I think you would also work a bit on the data. Um, can you, do you want to step in and then we'll look at the, the next questions that have come up? Neva? Yeah, I mean, can you hear me? Clearly. Okay. So, yeah, so the, just to say that if you, I think we should also send the small business RAB out with the presentations because we do have some geographical distribution, both by historic sort of apartheid geography and then also by province. And, um, you know, some of these substantive issues we're also talking about in the next input. So um, I don't think I'm going to speak to them now. I'd rather do the input and then we can talk based on that if that's okay. Thanks. Okay, I've got one more question in the room and then I'll go to the other questions online. I have a good morning, everybody. I think we said, uh, I just want to know if it's possible for you to actually unpack the performance of your cooperatives in the agricultural sector. Um, okay, let's look at the other questions. Okay, um, agribusiness, oh, I'm standing in front of the camera again. <laughs> um, agribusiness has been identified as one of the biggest opportunities for growth worldwide and very definitely in Africa. Um, there's a great opportunity for SME participation if we can link in our agribusiness value chains, including farming enterprise, agro processing, manufacturing, as well as logistics. Okay, I think it's more of a comment than a question. Okay, let's move to the next one. Um, why is our district development model like this, or how can we change to Mira, Ghana? Okay, I think that's a separate conversation. We haven't done anything on the district development model. Okay, next question. Um, is there an update of more small business and green industries uh, responding to climate adaptation and mitigation and building resilience? And then let's do one more. Is there any stats on support infrastructure access for small business or the patterns of access to infrastructure and equipment to boost the economy? Do you want to try that and the one more? Yeah. Sure, thank you so much. Um, the stats to support. Um, we haven't really looked at um, our statistics or databases outside of um, Contec. Well, this is South Africa being purely based on the annual financial statistics. So I'm not sure um, about stats to support infrastructure access for small businesses, but that's something that we can look into. Um, and then there was a question about, about something else. An update on green industries. Yeah, so I think a big gap in this edition of the small business RB is that we actually did not look at um, green industries. And I know the user types have done work around local green entrepreneurs, so it does not really have that green element. But I think for the next edition, that's something that we can definitely consider looking into in terms of, you know, when we talk about small businesses. Um, you know, are there small businesses in some of the emerging green industries and also what sort of support um, could uh, assist small businesses in terms of adapting, not just to climate, but also just being a lot more resilient um, when it comes to economic shocks being load shedding and I guess what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So I think, again, that speaks to more of, you know, more work that is needed to be done by us um, to better this um, uh, analysis of the small business sector. And I think we were asked about cooperatives in agriculture. Um, that is beyond my understanding and beyond the scope of the work, but I think that maybe Neva can answer that because she does a lot of work in um, agricultural reality chains, so I think I'm going to and was there anything on support infrastructure? I think Neva's one might touch a little bit on that. On the stats, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have not looked at any stats. Um, but yeah, maybe it's something we can look at for the next edition. Thank okay, you. let's just check if there's any... Uh, I think a lot of these are comments. Um, uh, so. 
Okay, the agribusiness in the stats, you did, did you break down? No, by no, no, so usually when we look at the real economy, um, so this is the real economy bulletin, we don't we, we don't focus on agriculture. Um, we look at manufacturing, mining, and, and construction. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately we did not look at um, agricultural sectors, but that's to say it does have data. So again, um, in order to improve analysis in this edition, we are able to look at um, agriculture because there is statistics, but because it's an REB, um, we usually exclude um, agriculture. But obviously agriculture does play an important role as Karen said, when it comes to job creation, um, she made a comment earlier. So I definitely agree that maybe we can have a separate um, addition outside of REB that actually looks at agribusiness and agriculture. Okay, thanks. Um, we're gonna Sorry, can I add something, Shul? Can I just say okay, something? I was going to say, Niba, do you want to um, come in with your responses and then um, what we're going to do is just go straight into your presentation. So if you want to answer any of the questions, then we'll move into um, your presentation. Thanks. Okay, I mean, just to say we do actually look at agriculture in the REB and there is a section on the production structure which shows the number of small businesses that we find in agriculture specifically um, in the actual REB. So like I said, I think we should send that out. It doesn't highlight them, but it does show what percentage of formal and informal um, employers and self-employed people are in agriculture. And I mean, I, I do think one of the things about agriculture is we do have a relatively small share of self-employment in agriculture compared to other upper middle income countries. That, that's one of the core areas where there's a backlog. In terms of infrastructure, we did do some work based on the um, survey of employer, employees, employers and the self-employed, which is basically informal sector because that's where you get the real backlogs in infrastructure. Um, so there's a little bit on that as well. Um, I would say that the main constraints on the this particular publication is that we were trying to work from official surveys and so on. We weren't doing our own surveys or particularly interviews. We were just trying to say, can we summarize the available data um, based primarily, I mean, almost exclusively on official statistics. I see, but do you want to go into your presentation? Um... Okay. So. That first slide. Cool. So I'm, um, yeah. I mean, what I, I the thing is that really this whole presentation is starts by saying one of the main reasons for high levels of inequality and joblessness in South Africa is as um, the Seco said that we have very low levels, particularly of self-employment compared to other upper middle income countries. Um, even compared to high income countries, but especially other developing economies. Um, and that has two implications. Firstly, that far fewer people earn their livelihoods from their own businesses. Um, and that actually accounts for more than half of the difference in employment in the employment ratio, which is the share of employed people as a percentage of all working age people. So we tend to act, you know, a lot of it is about capital intensity and then and, but a lot of it is also about the structure of ownership of business and how that and the lack, again, this absence of large numbers of self-employed um, people and employers in small business. But it also means that um, income from productive assets is much more unequally distributed than income from wages. Although income from wages is also very unequal compared to the rest of the world. Um, so those two factors obviously are behind, you know, some of the key factors behind the fact that South Africa still remains one of the most unequal economies in the world. Um, and what it means is that an industrial policy which aims at inclusive growth rather than just growth, we need to think about how can we step up the number of small businesses qualitatively you know, for us to get to around 20% of employment, which is the norm outside in upper, other upper middle income countries, and actually rather less than China, we'd have to have 2 million more enterprises. That's almost double as many as we have today. Oh, okay, so I think on the next slide, um, 
there's a question about why. And obviously, as Lissaka also said, it's shaped by apartheid history. There is, of course, a dependence on the mining value chain because although small businesses can provide some services around the mining value chain, um, the fact is the mines themselves, but also the refineries do tend to be large and capital intensive compared to other sectors. But there's also even more important probably was the destruction of black owned businesses, both rural and urban. And what you can see from the graph is we lag behind, particularly again in own account workers, not just in terms of um, family owned farms, but also in terms of urban family owned businesses. We lag very far behind other developing, other upper middle income economies. Um, and obviously that was an explicit policy under apartheid and even before apartheid to some extent. A further challenge though is that under apartheid, you know, we have this idea of what is the European living standard for employers and the self-employed in the formal sector. Um, and that tends to mean that people employ fewer people at lower wages in order to maintain higher incomes for themselves. And, you know, somebody said, should I go into a formal, should I go into small business? You know, if you're expecting to have the same income as you would have in a large scale company, then you're only going to go into, into small business if the opportunities are really outstanding. And that usually means if you have a degree, uh, and prefer, preferably a, a professional degree. Um, why does this lack? So if apartheid largely created the situation, part of the issue is why does it reproduce after the end of apartheid? Um, and I would argue that it's because we still have deeply unequal and therefore also very limited access to productive and financial assets. So to owning businesses, but also to having the savings that would let you invest in business without taking too huge a risk, as well as being able to do it at all. Um, but also education remains incredibly unequal. So does infrastructure and so does experience. So in other developing countries, you know, people tend to, in, to inherit their parents' business. They have the networks, they have the know-how just from working in the shop or in the, in the workplace. Um, they have a, a site where they can function that has at least some infrastructure. Here, most people are having to start from nothing with no family support really at all because their families have been, were deprived of that opportunity to have their own business over the last, you know, 50 to 200 years before 1994. In that context, those systems in government and the private sector are also not designed to, to support small business because again, they, were, they weren't there and setting up new systems is always hard and disruptive particularly around issues like, so for instance, how do small businesses get into industrial and commercial sites? Do, how do large companies and government procure from small business? How do they get access to finance? And how do they get licenses? So how do they, you know, the standards as we all know for municipal um, licenses are often far beyond what small businesses can do. And you get end up with this huge divide between formal small business that are able to do most of those things and informal business that is largely excluded. And that's true also for emerging business. Therefore, even emerging formal business may find it quite hard to access those assets and uh, systems. And I just wanted to put this up to reinforce that what you can see here is that, you know, the data really only go back what we have. You can go back to the early 2000s. But there's been, you know, gradual growth in small business and employment in small and large business. But there hasn't really been any qualitative shift. So in the numbers of employers and the self-employed, um, particularly in the formal sector and in the informal sector it tends to fluctuate um, depending. So when the formal sector gets smaller, the informal sector gets bigger, but we haven't seen the kind of qualitative change that would let us catch up with other developing economies. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, sorry, I should have said that. Yeah, so this is, sorry, what I was talking to, apologies. I'm looking at it on my own screen. Um, yeah, so what you can see is there just has not been a qualitative shift in the number of small business. And just to be clear, um, there, there was actually in the 2010s, faster growth in employment in large business than in small business. Okay, next slide, please, sorry. Okay, so if we wanna understand the constraints on emerging businesses more consistently, 
you know, we can look at them in terms of demand, in terms of the nature of the production structure and does it provide scope by opening up more labor intensive opportunities. And in terms of resourcing, which includes ownership of assets, but also skills and networks and infrastructure. By networks, I mean, you know, do you know who your customers are? Do you have your suppliers in place? All of those things that, like I said, with older businesses have been long established. And in other countries, that means small businesses have those things in place. Here, the systems that provide those are often not really designed to help small business. So if we look at the production structure, you know, we have relatively small labor intensive industries and limited small scale production in the dominant value chain. So the biggest value chain, you know, somebody was talking about exports, the biggest exporters in manufacturing in South Africa, it's totally dominated by the auto industry. Very hard to do very small scale production in the auto industry. Um, and then of course it's the mining value chain and it's commercial agriculture. Commercial agriculture arguably has more small scale businesses on the farming side, but food production, food processing tends to be highly capital intensive in this country, which is really contrary to the experience everywhere else in the world. Um, and you know, historically it's commercial agriculture and the mining value chains that had government support as well as some technologically advanced industries, again, notably the auto industry, where it's quite hard for small businesses to get into. We don't have that same kind of support for clothing or small scale food processing or any of the services um, outside of tourism, where you can, it's much easier for small businesses to break into. Um, and it's very hard, again, to shift those systems turns out to be quite difficult. On the demand side, we have very deep inequality, which makes it harder to get household demand for easily produced goods and services. So the half of all consumer demand is the, top, is the richest 10% of households. And they tend to be biased towards high quality goods, many of them imported, some of them crafts. The crafts, at least there's some space for small business, but you know the high quality mass production goods like iPhones, and cars are obviously not things that small businesses can produce. Um, and we've also had a problem with demand, which is relatively slow economic growth, except during the commodity boom in the early 2000s. Um, but also we have high joblessness and very unequal pay, which only a very limited amount of government redistribution to the government services and social grants, which means that in working class communities, demand is really low. So if you look at the per capita income in a township, it's less than a 10th of what you have in a historically white suburb. I mean, the suburbs are now integrated, but that's where the money is. So, it's, you know, we talk about township enterprises, but it's, there is a demand problem there. If you don't have government subsidizing some of these things, it's going to be very hard for businesses to take off. And then the entrepreneurs themselves, you know, they're suffering from shortfalls in capital and education and experience in networks and infrastructure. Um, so ownership of assets, both financial and productive assets is concentrated um, and also obviously land as well. Education remains unequal. People don't have family experience of entrepreneurship. Most communities, particularly working class communities don't have adequate municipal services such as electricity and water. Um, and they also don't have good broadband. Um, and commercial and industrial sites are really not open to small emerging businesses in most places. In fact, most communities, working class communities, don't have adequate commercial sites for small businesses to set up that are adequately serviced. Next slide. And like this poses a, a challenge for conventional industrial policy. Because we've always been told, you know, industrial policy aims to say, how do we get competitive in high tech industries, preferably in manufacturing? And, you know, except for professionals like engineers and lawyers and doctors, that kind of shuts out most self employed people yeah, who don't have those kinds of very high levels of skills that they can compete internationally. So the real question for a country like South Africa is how can we support sectors and industries that, where people, can generate incomes through employment and self-employment and which are sustainable, but they may never be internationally competitive. And how do we think about industrial policy as supporting those kinds of industries and that kind, those kinds of production? So some of the things we could look at is really large scale promotion of more labor intensive industries, even if we know they're only going to meet 
domestic and regional needs for the foreseeable future. So the idea that we can only support export industries cuts out huge swathes of the economy that are protected primarily by distance from other countries or because they're services where you need to have personal services um, supplied directly and trade in them is, is possible, but still quite difficult for many of them. You know, that would really mean we'd have to fundamentally redirect ind industrial policy from where we are now. So we always talk about labor intensive sectors. We never really talk about what that would mean. And can we actually compete in those sectors internationally, um, given latecomer status in, in particular? But what could we do in terms of labor intensive sectors that would generate livelihoods for, but focus mostly on local and domestic markets. Um, and that's really talking about extensive growth, which is extensive growth is when you grow by pulling in more resources rather than by raising efficiency. So your output grows because more people are employed, but also more other resources may be employed rather than just by increasing efficiency. And to be clear, so we don't get into like technical arguments, of course, everything is on a spectrum. If you're taking somebody who's unemployed, and helping them to produce anything at all, their productivity goes up. But what it does mean is we can't just say we're only going to grow by competing with cutting edge technologies at the global level, um, because that automatically excludes most people who are unemployed for the foreseeable future. Unless you can absolutely hit it lucky and find something that you can export faster than, it, than we've been able to to date. It would also mean that we have to find ways to expand demand for small producers so that you gradually get into a virtuous cycle where you have more equitable incomes, more equitable demand, and that in itself will make it easier for small business to grow. So we could have programs to subsidize necessities for working class communities, um, you know, like we do through things like school feeding systems and solar, but it would have and solar geysers that we did a few years ago. And in fact, most government infrastructure, but it would have to be on a much larger scale if we really want to step up demand for small businesses. As we all know, we could say, how can we transfer, transform procurement by government agencies, big business and formal retail, um, retail chains? But just to flag, most of the localization by government has actually not been focused on consumables and light industry products that small business could produce tended to focus on the big heavy capital equipment, which largely excludes small business in practice. Um, we could say, how could we make it easier for small businesses to access customers by ensuring that they have access to things like formal retail sites, taxi banks, um, government institutions like schools and hospitals, construction and other business sites on a much more consistent level. So when I say, Access to, to construction and business sites, that's largely things like catering and other consumables that workers might buy from them right there. Um, and then how can we then also ensure that we meet the needs of actual and potential entrepreneurs for resources, but it kind of often has to be holistic. So if you give people finance, but they don't have the skills and education to use it, they're just going to end up in debt. It's always been easier for government to talk about finance and skills, but not about things like infrastructure, industrial sites, and all of those things. So the question would be, how can we really give people more access to all of these resources? And I have to say, probably the hardest one is, is fixing the education system. But if we, as I think you could see from the SECO slides, and you'll see it in more detail in the REB itself, um, there is such a correlation between having a degree and being and being in the formal small business sector. Um, the only other place that has people with degrees at such an extent is in the um, is in government where you've got the big public services. And then finally, obviously, in the short run, if we don't do something about load shedding, all of this is kind of pointless. That we need some way to say, if, if the national grid will only be fixed in a couple of years, what can we do to mitigate the impact on small business by helping them get inverters, by helping them go off grid through solar or generators, um, by helping them get more efficient equipment. There are some programs in place to do that at the DTIC, but they're still pretty small. And they're obviously only geared toward the formal sector. So next slide, please. Talk. I mean, just to be clear, to give some examples, 
what ex would extensive growth look like? Well, some examples are people raised. Smallholder agricultural schemes where you have significant private or public extension financing and marketing support. You know, those kinds of schemes can become competitive, but they often don't start out that way. No? Um, but it is one way to get people, and they can, as we all know, if you're not careful, be very exploitative, as we have seen in forestry in particular. But at the same time, they can also be really important gateways for people to get into national and global value chains. We can do things like promote platforms for crafts, entertainment, hospitality, and services that raise standards, and we can help with marketing. So for instance, for entertainers, if we subsidize venues, stream, if we help people with streaming, we help people with producing and marketing paraphernalia and concerts. Uh, for ECD, similarly, if we could roll out subsidies for centers and working class communities with training and infrastructure, something that you know people committed to at the job summit but never really happened. And the point about early childhood development is obviously it also frees up women to also become employed um, if you do it on a mass scale. We could look at better new industrial and commercial sites for small businesses, you know, working class communities that are obviously then would have to be subsidized, at least initially. And we could provide government subsidies to low income housing, as I said, to do things like solar lighting and heating systems to have small scale transport like mopeds, e-bikes and bicycles to do computers and broadband connections, daycare and preschools again and school feeding schemes. These are all things that people need but can't afford in most working class households. So you can't just say, why don't we just provide them the service if people can't afford to pay for the service? You need some way to make it accessible or the structure of demand is such it will not emerge, even though if people have those services, they become more productive and society becomes more productive. And to be clear, we have a lot of these kinds of programs, but they're on a tiny, tiny scale. No? And our industrial policy is so much geared towards competitiveness that these kinds of programs rarely become a major part of it. So if you ask people, what should we do for industrial policy? They're thinking about what can we export? Where's the niche product? They're not thinking about if we prioritize employment and particularly self-employment and small business, what would our industrial policy look like? So, and just to be clear, nobody's saying this is our first best. I mean, first best return into China. This is not going to happen anytime soon because we don't have a billion people in, in the country for a start. And secondly, because we coming from a very different place of profound inequality that in China, they dealt with essentially through, you know, 30 years of, destruction of the old regime. Um, if we don't want to have that kind of upheaval, then we really have to say, what is the second best that will deal with the unemployment problem in a way that is sustainable, even if it's not as you know, high tech and cutting edge and may not even bring as fast growth in the medium term as a traditional industrial policy, but actually meets the needs of society and really does talk about apartheid backgrounds. So in effect, what I'm saying is, we need to have a conversation about what are our actual priorities for industrial policy and what would the end state then look like if we're serious about inclusive growth and not just growth. Real boha. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Neva. We can take that um, Let's go to questions in the room and questions online. Questions in the room. I think maybe for myself uh, and for clarity, um, it's the first workshop I've been to, but um, taking away from what I've put in terms of the presentation, I see a lot of focus on um, creating employment, which is quite um, important. And then I heard a lot coming through with regard to education, you know, the level of people who understand the economy and how the economy works. It's very low in terms of what would be required for us to shift the economy. So I do get the fact that there's a huge drive that needs to take place in terms of education. But I think also is there um, some sort of a conversation that we can start to have that looks at educating people on um, how the economy functions, the issues of consumption and production, because I think if I was sitting in a township and I were thinking, okay, I'm going to start a business, I don't know if the first thing I'm going to think of is <laughs> what there's a product that everyone uses in the township, for example, space soft, fabric softener. 
you know, am I thinking that I could actually create a competitive product that I can manufacture within the space that I'm in and try and source raw materials within the space that I'm in and start to dis distribute it within the space that I'm in? You know, so I think what I'm trying to say is that we're always trying to think of, you know, what's the next new thing, but we're actually not necessarily thinking of where are the opportunities within the existing value chain of production and consumption in our immediate um, communities, whether you're in a township or outside of a township. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my question is that with the stats that has been presented in terms of the number of informal uh, or small businesses that are out there. Am I correct if I say that number is based on what you put from status? And then if that's yes, what's actually the universe that's out there for South Africa in terms of small businesses? Um, are there any more questions in the room? Otherwise, we'll look. Hang on. So I didn't. So I didn't really understand that last question. Could you maybe? Um, this is a bit of clarity on your question. I'm saying when the simple presented earlier, I think she said the number of small businesses or informal business grew to 710,000. And, and then she nodded when I said, is that based on what the numbers that have been registered with the, with the, with, with the Department of Trade and Industry or whatever, where depending on where the states have got the information. Now, my question is that if that's yes, and was the actual universe of because that number sounds to be very local if one looks at the number of small businesses that are out there in in SA totally. Um let's go online. There's lots of comments. I don't know if they're questions. The evasive issue is the number of small businesses in SA. In some sources it's estimated 1.5 million. Your presentation reflects quarter of this is part of a decline. The question is how many SMEs do we have in the country? Okay, I think that was presented, but, but we can go so back. Can I just speak to that quickly? Yeah, go for it. Because it's pretty easy. What we did with the REB was we looked in the labor force surveys at the number of people who are employers or self-employed. Um, the formal figure is the like 700,000 one. There's over a million people in the informal sector. No? So basically, there's about twice as many people in the informal sector as in the formal sector. And I don't know, Lissako, if you want to put the slide up. Those are people who say they are either employers or self-employed. So it's possible that people, small businesses, but they don't see themselves as employers or self-employed. Um, and it's also, there are like a million people registered with, a million companies registered with CP, CIPC, but many of those are not actually operational. So it's always really hard to say if you look at CIPC is, you know, how many of them are actually still functional is very hard to see. So again, you know, how good these surveys are, we can have a debate about that. Um, but they're pretty consistent and they're very large surveys. They, they survey 30,000 households. So we can see in the data the formal businesses um, and that's at the 710,000. Um, that we see in, by 2022, and on the informal own account workers, it sits at 1.4 uh, million. So yeah, we, we're sitting at in total, um, it would be about two million um, over two, two point, 2.1, 2.3. Oh, okay. So then we also add this figure in as well. Okay. So and then in addition, we've got. Um, the that would be employers okay so there's employers so there's um businesses informal businesses that employ someone plus people who just employ themselves so they they're not an employer and then we've got the, the formal businesses um that we have and then formal own account um businesses so that's where it's just one formal person they're registered but it's just one person so we're looking at a total universe to answer your question of about 2.3 million, you say, Okay. So, so yeah, that's, yep. that's our total figure. Is that clear? Yeah. And can I just add something that if you also look in the, in the actual document, what you can see is that with COVID, the number of people employed in, this, in small businesses, small formal business and large formal business as well, but especially small formal business 
has remained relatively depressed. And so one reason you see that spike in informal self-employment um, is probably because people are giving up on the formal sector and trying to create some kind of income for, the, for themselves because we're still about half a million behind, even now half a million behind in formal employment. Yeah. Okay, so if we had kept, if there was no COVID, this graph would have gone up and this graph would have gone up. <laughs> uh, oh, um, load shedding may be another problem. Okay. So, so I think, and then moving to what Neva was saying is to double the number of enterprises. So if we want to get the economy to where it should be and catch up to what an economy like South Africa could become, we, we effectively need to double the number of formal and informal to get to that um, two million more enterprises um, in the country. Um, okay, can we close the presentation and go to chats. Okay, so the question is, we've seen lots of programs since 94, but why is the growth so small? Okay, and then corin has got some response there. Um, what about the regulatory environment at the municipal, municipal level? Could there be costless reforms? Okay, so that's our next question. Um, okay, so Neva, you got those two questions. Um, do you want to talk to those um, and then we'll go to more questions? Okay, so tell me if I missed one of them because I think I made. Look, I just to say the very first question before we got into numbers was why don't people also just produce goods for their communities? And just to be clear, it's easier with services and design intensive products than with manufactured goods that everybody uses, but that actually are just much cheaper if you produce them on a large scale or relatively large scale. So it's easier to get into, you know, produce baked goods in a cafe that people will find special than to produce something like soap, unless you do like some kind of special scented soap. And part of the problem is because people also can't afford those goods, or you provide basic services like childcare that you cannot be produced on a large scale, or you have government subsidizing some necessities that maybe are produced normally produced on a large scale, but small businesses can get in in terms of um, final processing, final distribution, final installation. So I think we would have to think quite carefully because if we only look at manufacturing basic products, it's just, you know, in the modern world, you know, it's one thing to say you want to do extensive both, you don't have to be fully competitive, but if your prices are, I mean, look at what just happens with vaccines. If your new producer is going to cost twice as much as the established one and the product is less consistent because they're new at it, it's likely to be not as well that we find. Then it's really hard to, to, to sell that. So I think we do have to think about some of these issues about what are the kinds of products and services in particular that small emerging businesses and small businesses can produce yeah? um, and find a market of any kind, even if they can't export. Um, so I, I think it's important to say, how can we be innovative about these things? But I also think we have to think through where is the niche, what, where are the parts of the economy that are really good for small business? And then how do we support those? Um, you know, regulatory stuff, yes, it's a costless reform, but by itself, I don't think it's adequate. This really comes down to what is the main constraint on small business? And honestly, people always bring up regulations and I have personally as business representatives what are the main five regulations they're talking about? And honestly, they rarely know. And I think it does become a bit like taxes where, you know, regulations are always too much, taxes are always too high, wages are always too high. They're costs if you're a business. But separating out which ones are actually genuinely both unnecessary and a significant blockage to business is easier said than done. You know, so for instance, there's a lot of excessive regulation of ECD in formal urban areas. I think we all agree on that. At the same time, you don't want people just warehousing kids with people who don't know what they're doing. So figuring out what is the right level of regulation for that is quite difficult. Um, and it always looks like an easy fix, but there's a reason that it's been very, very hard to do. And that is both that the regulations are complicated and everywhere, and a lot of them are municipal bylaws, which means there's lots of different variations all over the place. But it's also because 
they're often trying to achieve something important. The way they do it may be somewhat heavy handed. Getting the cost benefit balance right is hard. But I would say that even if we deregulated the vast majority of potential small entrepreneurs in the country couldn't take advantage of it because they still couldn't get the money or the skills or the networks or the inputs or the outputs or identify where there's demand if there is demand for their product. And we need to really look at these things in a more holistic way if we're serious about supporting, you know, genuinely new emerging enterprises rather than just, you know, making it slightly easier for people who would probably be able to function as small business people anyways. So I don't know if you want to add to that. You're actually, you know, you have more experience on this than me in practice. Okay, um, okay is that on the small business programs? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, one of the things- That, that was about that, the importance of deregulation. <laughs> okay, I mean, so, so there's, there's a few things um, that, that I would come in and, and respond on. So the, the one is, I mean, we, we have to be cautious on the deregulation. Um, some of the regulations are there for environmental purposes. Some of the regulations are there. Some of the regulations are there to protect consumers. Um, so, so we need to look at what, what is needed and what is not needed. Um, and what is over requirements and what enables businesses. So, so the, these are things that we need to trade cautiously. Um, and you know, there, there, there are some costs in compliance, but some of them are to protect workers. So you know, there's a need to have workers registered for um, workers' compensation if something happens and things do happen. You know, someone, you know, breaks something, they can't work for a couple of months and workers' compensation need to, you know, um, to, to help out that, that employee who's now stuck or they need their, their UI. Yet. So there, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword sometimes, these regulations. Um, but they do add to the cost. So some of it is how do we, and part of what we need to be thinking about in terms of small business support programs is how do we make it easier for people to comply um, and simplify the compliance processes so that we, we enable people to register, but you know maybe there's one form rather than 12 forms, or maybe there's an officer who's dedicated to helping small businesses you can just make it very easy for someone to register also online to, to simplify some of these things and make it clear and explicit. So there's things that we can do differently rather than make it this, this hurdle. Um, I know that for um, registering employees for UIF, it can be a real administrative burden because it's just so complicated to get those things sorted out. You've got websites, you've forms to fill in, you don't really know what you're doing. And you've never done this before. You don't even know anyone who can ask to help you out, um, particularly if you're registering for the first time. So there's a lot that we can do on that. Then, then there was a question on, you know, we've been doing small business support for, um, you know, it's one of the, the earliest things that we started doing in terms of the, the South African government's national strategy. Um, and we haven't got it right since 94. And, and what, I mean, for me, what we're saying in the, in the paper that Niva's done is that um, we need to look at these things differently. We, we can't just keep on the same path. You know, there have been growth in small businesses, but what we also see is that every time there's a big shock, you know, sometimes out of our control, a global financial crisis, a, you know, global health pandemic, we see the number of businesses plump. So if Niva had gone further back, we would have also seen that up until 2008, or think the your data would have shown, up until 2008, we were, we're starting to see growth in the number of small businesses. There's a global financial crisis out of our control, but it has a knock on impact on global demand. There's a tightening of credit markets. There's a whole lot of other things that happen. And we see small businesses being the ones that are hit the hardest in the global financial crisis. Then the recession coming out of it, it takes us about seven or eight years just to get back to the same number of businesses. And then we hit with the COVID-19 pandemic, which again, you know, four years later or three years later, we're only starting to see the numbers back again. So every time there's a big shock, it means that there's a resilience problem. It means that something is not working to protect small businesses in our economy, that so many can um, be hit so hard when we have these pandemics. And the other thing is we do need to do things differently. We do need 
what we're saying is a step change. We need to double. That's not, you know, the gradual pathway. It's, it's something fundamentally different, which means a lot more resources, both on the financial and the non-financial side, that, that can support and enable small businesses and the infrastructure and other support measures. So that will be our next paper that we look at, um, is what, what are some of the things that we actively need to do differently in order to unlock the growth in the small business um, sector. Neva, um, there's also something about um, municipalities that Alan was asking. Um, I don't know if you want to come in on that, given our LED paper. Yeah, no, look, they, there are problems with the municipal regulations and we've always tried to say, can we do some model bylaws on these things? Because often what you have is the regulations were copied from Europe they require capacity that we simply do not have. And so you get these extraordinary delays or people get you know, hounded in the breach, but actually there's no enforcement even where the standards are sensible because just the whole process is too cumbersome. And I would argue we really need to rethink all of these systems to say, because remember municipalities are supposed to do health and safety licensing. And they're also supposed to do things like ensure people don't dig the roads up too often. And that if they do, they cover them up, those kinds of things um, around infrastructure. Um, you know, and often the systems are just unnecessarily cumbersome. And we did actually try to develop a, a methodology for saying, can we look at these things to come up with a way that really says, how do we think about, are these costs excessive? Or are some costs necessary, but which ones in terms, in terms of the benefits that we need to get? But how do we minimize the cost to businesses? Um, but the real problem is it just takes a huge amount of time to go through all of the different bylaws and laws to actually try and streamline them. Um, and, you know, what you tend to have is it might happen in the metros because they have more capacity, but in small towns that have just copied the metros, they may be several years behind. So, yes, it is a problem. Um, and I think we really need original thinking there, but we just haven't, again, put in the capacity, which being, you know, I just wanted to say, which goes back to what I think Scott was saying, which is we've got small businesses, the number of small businesses has grown proportional to the economy, but we need a qualitative step up and getting there would be very disruptive. And part of it is, you know, how much of a disruption are we prepared to tolerate in order to have a more inclusive economy in the longer run? Because that kind of, you know, sharp step up change is disruptive, is expensive, is risky. And we've never really been willing to do that, whether it's in the regulations or any of the other things like land reform, that you would probably need to have a stronger self-employed class and small business class in South Africa. Ellen, I don't know if that answers your question. I need a extraordinary. Um, I have a question to you and to the circle. Um, that just assumption, I don't know how much data we have, but I did want to ask a question about our history in South Africa, even from the apartheid years. I mean, I'm not so sure. I, I grew up in a small free state town. And when I started my first business um, back in 1996, my parents were really devastated that I went into starting a business because they said, this, you know, this is like a parasite. The business is like a parasite that feeds off the system. And, um, you know, in my, when I finished my PhD 20 years later, my mother said to me, are you now going to get a real job? Which she meant is like working for the railways, or for the hospital, or for Sassel, or for ESCOM, or somebody, um, you know, significant. So I just wanted, you know, we're beating ourselves now where we are with, with small enterprises. But isn't there something in our history also that maybe even just from a part that we've been struggling to start, um, you know, companies? That's the, that's the one common the second comment is, um, I had a flashback the other day, um, opening, emptying out my um, filing cabinet, and I found the TIPS event in the year 2000 or 2001 about micro strategies for growth or something like that. And there we had a lot of controversy arguing about where do small enterprises come from? And at that time, so that was now, I can't remember if it was 2000 or 2001, but it was before, definitely before Saul was there. Um, that time, we saw that companies were started at a certain size, and then they grew from there. But very few companies started from a size of two employees, and then they grow to 20 or to 200. Companies with 200 employees very often were started at 180, you know, or 
companies with 100 employees maybe were founded and in, in the first year they grew to 70. So my question is, are we still expecting these businesses to grow from very small to become medium? Or, or can we also in the industrial policy space ask, how do we get people to spin out companies or to start companies that create more significant employment from the first, you know, from let's say the first year? That's all from my side. Thanks. Let me take the Sefa if you want to respond, if you can, and then any concluding comments. And then Neva, if you want to then um, um, answer Sean's question and give your closing comments. Thank you, so um... I think my closing remarks is just going to be around just the importance of data when it comes to small business, because I think even when we were doing the research, it was really a struggle to find um, data that supported, you know, what we all know or, or think we know about small businesses. And I think that, um, you know, even I was looking at the recent draft of um, SMME policy that was released by the department. Um, a few days ago that Nando shared with us, and it also speaks about the importance of having a database, you know, that actually speaks to, um, you know, us knowing or informing us about the number of small businesses in the country, because I think particularly when you're looking at whether it's, you know, adapting to climate change, you're looking at, you know, green entrepreneurs, or looking at actually, you know, financing um, uh, small businesses and you know, supporting them when it comes to load shedding. It's really important to know um, the number of small businesses that you're dealing with. It's important to know that you know when these shocks happen, you know who are the vulnerable um, people who are affected, right? And I think that the data really has been important there, showing us the evidence um, uh, that matches most of what we know about small business. So um, I think that you know everyone has, particularly when it comes to the gaps, um, the data gaps. Um, I think we still have quite a lot of work to do, but I think that, um, yeah, I think this was good in terms of just, you know, making people understand um, what the small business landscape looks like in terms of data and statistics. Thanks. Thanks. Neva, any want to try and answer Sean's question and concluding remarks? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is like anything. There are many, you can come up with the whole range of of subjective and objective factors about why people behave the way they do. But sometimes if you don't object the objective factors, getting the subjective factors to change isn't adequate. So I think, you know, the fact that most people in South Africa don't have a history of being small business owners and operators is obviously a stumbling block. But if their conditions are such that they actually cannot effectively open a small business and make a reasonable living off it, then that will persist. Yeah. So I think it's, to me, it's more about saying, how do you set up conditions for people to succeed? And then they'll be more interested in going into it. I would say that, um, you know, a lot of this gets back to this issue of how, you know, if we're serious about dealing with unemployment, we can either hope to get larger businesses to open and create those jobs, or we can try and promote self-employment and small business. And then what we can see, not so much in terms of small businesses as employers of wage workers, but self-employment is where we're really short compared to other upper middle income countries. And that shortfall in itself, and it's not just, it's part of it is farming, but small urban businesses. And that shortfall in itself explains a lot of the unemployment problem in South Africa. So the question is, is it actually possible to resurrect a, a strong small business sector or do we think that was smashed by apartheid? It's not possible. Then what we can do is fall back on medium and large companies because we're not going to get the kind of employment that small businesses generate in other countries without that self-employment sector because that's where a chunk of that missing employment is. No? Um, thank you very much to our speakers, to the CFO, to Neva. Thank you very much for your inputs and for the robust um, conversations that we've been having. Um, I see there's lots of comments in the, the chat. We didn't get to all of the, um, the questions, but I think we've had a very useful discussion. Our papers are on the TIPS website, um, and so all the presentations from today also be made available on the TIPS website. Um, if there's also lots of other useful material.
um, and we'll email the, the papers and presentations out to everyone who registered um, and attended today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and for a great conversation. Thanks, have a good afternoon.